Hey everybody, Thomas here. Today we've got an interesting video. We're going to go over blades. And as you see, I have a pile of five saw blades here. And these are five saw blades from five different manufacturers. And there's a lot of differences between each of these blades. Let me get a little close up here so you can see. So we're going to go over just kind of the differences in blades and what all those crazy numbers mean. A lot of people, when they buy a sawmill and everything, they stick with one blade. And they don't really venture off from that very often. That was me a couple years ago. Now, with this YouTube channel, it allows me to continually, le continually learn about sawmills, bandsaw blades, and looking and meeting new people and trying to you know, put out the information that I learned from there. So, I figured this would be a good time to go over different blades. What they what those numbers mean and the applications for each type of blade. And also some tools and stuff that you can use to help you, uh, you know, choose the right blade for you. So let's begin. First things first, we're going to look at these two blades. I've got, like I said, I had five blades. I've actually put a total of six up here. I've got, I brought one more up here just so I can have two different sets of blades uh, for each section of the video. First things first, these blades right here um, are wooden miser double hard blades. These are essentially their premium blades, and I've been extremely impressed with the performance of these blades. The name Double Hard, we're going to get into what that means here in a little bit, and we're going to go over some pros and cons with this blade. Uh, this is a 55 thousandths blade. The bottom blade here is a 737. The top blade here is a 747. We're going to go over what those numbers are as well in just a second. But first things first, we're going to talk about when you first open a box of blades, what should you see, what should you expect? In a quality blade. Well first things first if you go and look at the weld you'll see some discoloration and stuff here but even before that you want to make sure there's no burrs and that your weld material so the area where it's welded feels about the same as the rest of the blade. There's no dip in thickness or anything like that. Everything seems consistent. Feel on the back side, feel on the gullet. If the gullet has uh, any burrs and stuff in there, if you're sharpening or setting your own blades, the burr in there can cause your setter or sharpener to either do a short throw or a long throw for your next movement. Probably gonna be a short throw because the pushing arm will catch on a burr and instead of going the full tooth spacing, which is seven eighths on this blade, uh, you could get like a half that, almost like a half of a inch tooth spacing. And then the next time your stone comes down, you could take off teeth if it's sharpening. So again, inspect your weld, make sure your welds look good. You should never have your blade breakages at your weld. If you consistently are getting blade breakages at your weld, contact the manufacturer where you got the blades from. They might have a bad batch or something like that. There could be an issue in their annealing process, all sorts of stuff like that. But if you're getting failures at the weld, that's something you should definitely reach out to the company where you bought your blades. And I would say most companies out there would probably, if you sent them pictures where it's breaking at the weld, they'd probably say, okay, sorry for that will send you some blades and replacement. Okay, um, again, the weld process is really neat. And here in the next couple weeks, I'll be heading down to Georgia to go check out some blades uh, from Southeast Metals and possibly some other blade manufacturers down there and seeing their process. So stay tuned for that video in the future. And we'll have a little more, I guess, explanation then too. But first thing, again, we have this, this discoloring there. The discoloring here is from the annealing process. The annealing process is an important step in the blade. If you're not seeing discoloration here or something like that, maybe they don't do annealing or maybe it's just not as, uh, uh, pro, uh, I guess, pronounced in the type of material. And I'll show you another blade that it's not as pronounced because the whole blade is essentially heat treated. So again, the annealing process, you could, I guess, do it with a torch. But really, the most common way that most manufacturers do it is with uh, induction or current going through the blade through a small section. And what that does is it heats up there and allows the blade to cool at a controlled rate, which makes sure that this weld section here is not going to be brittle, but rather has almost the same malleability and same properties as the metal out here. If you have just a hard, brittle weld right here, it will fail at the weld every single time. So annealing process is very important. Now, these are called double hard blades. I am not actually sure if this is the reason, but I can kind of see this. On the blades themselves, you can almost see two distinctive 
lines of heat treatment. So where these tips are, you can see the tips are a different color. That is actually due to a heat treatment process. I see two distinct lines on there. So that leads me to believe that these are double hardened. So there could be a low heat and then a high heat or a high heat then a low heat, whatever that may be. But again, hardening of the tooth tip and everything allows that tooth tip to be um, harder, therefore hold an edge a lot longer than a blade that is not uh, hardened at the tip. And there are blades out there that are not hardened at the tip and they, they cut just fine. Um, but there are issues, again, there's always pros and cons to everything you do to improve a blade in any, any performance. There's a, I guess, a, a performance ratio and everything, but anything that you do to improve some performance is going to degrade some other type of performance. Mr. Robert, my buddy down in uh, Mississippi, does not care for double hard blades. And the reason is because when you go to set these, you have to be very careful that you're setting low enough on the tooth, not high on the tooth. If you set up here in the portion where it's been hardened everything, you'll snap it every time you try to set it. So you gotta set a little bit lower. And if you're setting lower, it means you have to set a little bit less than if you were setting higher up in the blade, I think. Maybe I got that backwards. But anyways, long story short, if you are setting your own blades and if they're double hard blades, take caution. If you start hearing click, 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 that means you're popping teeth off. Be very cautious and everything. Again, though, a double hard tooth will hold its sharpness a lot longer. So there's a, there's pros and cons to that. Okay, so there's that. We were also talking about the numbers behind the blade. So there's a couple interesting numbers on these blades. These are inch and a half blades, 55 thousandths. This is a 737, that's a 747, and they're 7 eighths tooth spacing. I'm sorry, not inch and a half, they're inch and a quarter, my bad. So inch and a quarter is measured from the tip of the tooth down, and you can see that is an inch and a quarter like on the spot. This one right here, inch and a quarter on the spot. So that's the top of your tooth down to the back side of your blade. That is your blade uh, width. The 55 thousandths, that is your thickness. So I can't really angle the blade because, and I'm gonna talk about the pros and cons as well. A 55 thousandths, that's the thickness of the material. From, from where my thumb is to where my index finger is on the back side, that's the thickness of the material. This is a thick blade. This is a stiff blade. You, I can't really bend this blade that well, and there are definite pros to that. If you're cutting really, really hard material, if you're cutting frozen logs, if you're cutting material that goes from soft to hard, aka a knotty pine or something like that, a blade like this is less likely to travel on you because you have that added backbone strength of that blade. It will not really want to... Uh, you know, travel through the wood in such a way uh, that'll cause waves. It, it's it's harder to do that. Okay, that's a pro. Um, you can also push this blade a little bit harder because you have so much more material here in the back on the back side of this. Again, your teeth are hard. Your backbone, based on the material, there are different types. There are also bimetal blades. We're going to get into that in a different video. But for a blade like this, your backbone here should have a little flex to it, whereas your teeth do not because they're hardened. If you had a, a bimetal blade, that could be, okay, you have one type of metal here at the tooth that has a property of, say, uh, hard or something like that, but you have a, a, a less flexible or, or more rigid um, backbone here, if you will. There, there's all sorts of different types and everything. Bimetal blades have a special purpose and everything. I don't use them. I have some friends of mine who do, but that'll be, again, another video. Okay, so we've talked about the tooth spacing. Tooth space, no, we haven't. We talked about the width of the blade. That's an inch and a quarter. Tooth spacing is from tip to tip. Now, it's, it's gonna be hard to show that on here. You're gonna kinda take my word for it. Well, maybe I, it's, it's actually easier than I thought. So you can see from tip to tip there, uh, I'm reading seven eighths on the dot. So that is your spacing. You have to be careful whenever you're using a setter, whenever you're using a sharpener, using the correct cam to go with that uh, on a, Cook's Cat Claw uh, Sharpener. They have a whole lot of different cams that switch out on the wood miser. They do have two cams that they typically use, and there's a range that the cam can work for. Um, typically, it's like a half inch all the way up to an inch, and then you have another one that's like three quarters of an inch all the way up to an inch and a half or something like that. But neither here nor there, that's just a measurement you need to know. So you know your width, which is inch and a quarter. You know your two spacing, seven eighths. You know your thickness is 55 thousandths. Now we're gonna talk about your tooth angles and stuff like that. 
So this is a 747, that's a 737. You can see the teeth on the 747, they look like they're taller. And that they look like they're taller, but they're actually not taller. What makes them look like that is because you don't have as much material behind here. That back angle here is a 47 degrees. So it's a steeper uh, approach in the backside and the front face is a seven degrees. So perpendicular would be zero. Seven degrees forward. And then if you go to the backside here, again, it's 47 degrees um, off the back. So that's, that's kind of your measurements there. On the bottom one here, again, you have a little more material back here because this is a 37 degrees. These are kind of unique uh, hook angles and stuff like that, if you will, to wooden miser. Wood miser is really big on a seven degrees, and a seven degree blade will cut pretty much anything you want to cut. It's a very middle of the road um, hook angle on the blade and everything, and I've cut a lot with it. Uh, I've been very impressed with, the, with how a seven degree works. Uh, I have not tried a 747 yet. I would think this would be more of like a softwood type blade if you're cutting a lot of pine and stuff like that um, because you again have less material on your teeth. You don't want to cut something super hard with that because there's less material there. And it's going to fatigue on you a little bit sooner. Um, another blade, which is one I have on the sawmill currently, is a four degree blade. So that means it's a, I guess it's a probably a, it's probably a 430. So it's a four degree face angle, 30 degree back angle. So that again, four degrees off of center, um, off a of perpendicular, off the front face. Okay, so we've gone over those blades. These ones here, again, wood miser, double hard, uh, quality blades, blades, very, very thick, uh, very, very uh, strong, long lasting blades, but also they are premium blades and premium blades do have a premium price tag with them. Now, let's go ahead and show you these blades right here. Zoom in a little bit. Okay, so not the best example because the bottom blade here is, is, is a used blade. Uh, the top blade is a Monkford's blade, and it is a 1030. The bottom blade here is a Ripper S blade. It is also a 1030, and both these blades are either 41 or 42,000. So these as you can see, are a lot more uh, flexible, if you will, than that 55,000th blade. Um, really, all I want to show on this, these are both the same hook angle. So if you match these two up, I mean, I can't get the blades exactly straight, but yeah, you can't really see anything, any difference between them. They are the same exact tooth profile. They're 7 8 tooth spacing. They are a, a 10 degree off center or off that perpendicular uh, front face and a 30 degree back. A 1030 blade is your most common blade profile out there. Uh, it's lasted, it's been out there for a long time. A lot of people have cut pretty much anything with it. You can cut hardwoods, you can cut softwoods, you can cut anything you want with this. Um, however, uh, there are some differences in these two blades. Now, it's hard to tell because this blade right here, I ran this blade hard. This is a blade I use during my testing and everything. And I pretty much ran it past, I ran it to the point where it was done. I'll say that. You can't really see any heat treatment left in that, that tip. And that means I was heating up the tips or anything, probably because the set was coming out of it. And that's something I haven't shown yet either too. Um, you can see on this one, a nice solid heat treatment in the tip there. And it goes down pretty far into the actual tooth tip, almost goes down to the gullet. Whereas on the wood miser one, again, that heat treatment's only the tip, but it's a pretty pronounced double treatment, it looks like. So probably the wood miser tips are a tad bit harder, but this tip right here probably is going to be a lot easier to do um, just because it, it hasn't been hardened that, that second time or whatever. Um, set. So let's go ahead and measure the set on these blades. I don't remember what the blade set is but oh i got a dog in my face nope get down lucy thank you get down all right so right here we have dial indicator and everything first things first i'm going to zero it out this is hard to do in my angle but <laughs> i'll get it right yet i'm trying to do it where you can see it on film so let's move this around all right, so first things first, we're gonna go ahead and zero out on a flat spot on the blade. 
I like to do in the bottom of the uh, tooth, if you will. So zeroed out. So there's a difference here because I last zeroed it on my other blade. I hope I'm in zoom or in, in film here. So, yep, she's zeroed out right there. Now we're going to measure the tooth facing the dial indicator. It's right there. So, what is that? About 19 thousandths or so? Double check another one. Seems that that's a little bit low. I might have to re adjust how I have this on here. I missed it. Okay, so I'm reading two 19 thousandths. Again, it's hard to tell from my angle. I might have to zero this thing out again. Give it one more go. I thought these were around 21, 22 thousandths. Okay, reading zero there. Okay, so 19, 20 thousandths, something like that. That's that's your set on the tooth. So you have an an up tooth, a straight tooth, a down tooth. Up tooth, straight tooth, down tooth. You have that all the way around the blade. However, you have to be careful around any welds. The welds, it could change on you. So let's go ahead and rotate this around to the weld and see if we can see if it's changing that or not. And that's based on the length of your blade. I mean, it it's not a big deal. It's just something you have to watch for in the whole uh, process of, uh, you know, sharpening and setting your blades. Now, this is actually a good example. Move it back around this way. This is a good example right here of something you have to watch for, especially if you're setting your own blades. See that little tip right there in the gullet of the weld? Before you set or sharpen this blade, you need to take that down. Take your angle grinder to that and take it down. Also, I don't see any annealing into this blade. There might not be based on the material they're using here, but I'm not seeing annealing on this blade, but the weld quality looks good. It's nice and flush up against the back there. So, and I have run this blade, not this blade specifically, but I have run a box of these blades. I got nothing bad to say about these. These are again, those Monkford Sauger, Monkford blades, excuse me. Very good quality material um, blade. I've run a lot of wood through these. But again, there is that little nib, the little nub right there. You wanna make sure you take that, that nub off or anything because that can cause a, a short throw on your setter or your sharpener. Okay, so we found the weld. We're gonna look, I'm just gonna look from the side here and I'll kind of give you what I see. Okay, that is a, uh, that goes this way. I'm gonna call this way as an up tooth and this way as a down tooth. So up tooth, down tooth, straight tooth. Up tooth, straight tooth, up tooth, down tooth, straight tooth. So you can see the pattern change right past the weld because I'm on track until here and then it changes on me and goes to a different direction. So this section right here will throw you off, especially if you're setting. It doesn't affect it on sharpening, but if you're setting, this is where you need to be careful of. So always mark your weld when you're using your sharpener or setter. Okay, so again, that shows those. Now let's move over to this last set of blades we have over here. Ta-da! Now these are the funky blades. There's a lot of interesting things going on here. You've got this blade here, which is a weird color. What is going on? Well, this is a new blade that we've been testing everything. It's a blade uh, where the blade stock comes from Germany. This blade didn't have any camber in it and stuff beforehand, uh, but the new ones that are coming out do. However, I have run this blade. It doesn't look like this. I've actually run this blade for two logs worth and it stays nice and clean. And I can see a little bit of, you know, decay and stuff on there. I see some scratch marks on here. So whatever this it looks like a bluing material, which shows, I think this is that the, the backside of this blade has been heated in such a way. So you get that bluing and don't really see the annealing colors in here because it looks like the whole backside of the blade's been annealed. There's been heat added to this entire blade, but you can definitely see there is heat added to the tips as well. 
This blade is also interesting because the set on this blade is set extremely high up compared to our normal blade. And I don't know if I can show this on film. I'll have to take it out of the holder for that. And I gotta do a side-by-side -side comparison, so I'll have to grab another blade. But anyways, we're gonna take a look right here. Again, hard to show on film here. You'll just have to kind of take my word for it right now. But the set on this, you can see the actual crease of the tooth is what an eighth and an eighth inch or so above the actual gullet. And if we look at one of these teeth over here, without my dog getting in my face, uh, one of these teeth over here. Oh, she's all in my place. Let me move my dog out the way. Give me one second. Okay, so I've moved the dog now. These ones here, again, hard to show on film everything, but the crease of the actual uh, tooth where it folds up is closer to the gullet. These ones, again, they're high up. So again, the crease occurs about where the, uh, the, numb of the, ah, the nail of my thumb is. Hard to focus on that. Whereas on this one, the crease is where my thumb is there. So it, it's it's about, I don't know, less than an eighth of an inch difference. But these ones are set higher. That being said, when Mr. Robert sharpened or set blades like this for me, uh, he didn't have any issues with that. You just had to kind of look at it and you might have to adjust the height in your setter. Uh, this blade here, again, is a new blade that we're testing. So more to fall on this blade. But you can actually see kind of how heat was added all the way through the backbone of the blade. Interesting. And the oh, and this is also the standard seven, oh, excuse me, 10, 30. So 10 degree front face, 30 degree back angle. Okay, and then this next blade where we have right here, this is a chip sweep. So you can see a piece of the tooth looks like it's missing. There's a lot of good reasons to have a, a blade like this. A lot of the pallet manufacturers like to use blades like this because it clears out um, a little bit better with that raker tooth. You don't get as much sawdust remaining on your wood. Now we're going to be testing this blade here shortly to see how that theory holds up. But also what they found out is this blade design here is really good for cutting frozen logs because it chips that ice out first, if you will. And it allows uh, just a, a better blade performance in frozen wood. Frozen wood, if you've ever cut it, is very hard to cut. It can do some weird things. Your sawmill can sound atrocious when you're cutting through it. I've been testing out four degree double hard blades in frozen wood. It's done a very good job because it's a thick, you know, again, backbone of the blade and everything. And it's a blade that has a lot of set. I didn't talk about that, but these, these, 55 thousandths blades here, they're set at 25 thousandths. They will hold that set a lot longer because you've got thicker material there. Uh, this blade right here feels like a 45 thousandths. This blade right here feels like a 41 to 42 thousandths. And same with this blade right here, it's a 41 thousandths. And you can do that just by feeling it over time, you'll kind of feel that. But I can definitely feel that this, this center blade here, this, this chip sweep has a little more mass to it than the other ones. But again, Unique blades, the only drawback with these blades, I don't know if you can, you know, quote unquote, properly sharpen these. These are essentially a one-time use blade. And a lot of times in the pallet manufacturing world, uh, they don't really care about blade life per se or sharpening a blade. They run the blade until it's done. They swap on a new blade and they just continue on because it's all about how many boards can you cut up in the span of time and these blades right here, again, keep the surface of the wood cleaner. So therefore they don't have to worry about sweeping the wood because the blade actually is sweeping it for them. Um, yeah, so this blade right here, I believe it's actually a Casco blade, but I got this from Southeast Metals. It is a, uh, a blade that they sell almost primarily to the pallet manufacturers out there, but also to those who are cutting frozen logs. So stay tuned to the channel and you'll see some testing of this blade at some point as well as when we're cutting frozen logs, which we are continually cutting frozen logs all throughout the winter. So again, just a recap before I show one last thing. When looking at blades, 
there's a lot of different numbers to go into. Um, there's a lot of different options out there. And I'm gonna put up a screenshot here that shows what each of those degrees of blades and what I feel that they're good for and what you know some of the companies say that they're good for. Last thing I gotta show, uh, hopefully I put that up on the screen so you can see kind of what, what's best. Last thing I wanna talk about is um, how to measure your blade. Because if you're gonna measure, if you're gonna, if you're gonna get blades from a manufacturer other than your sawmill manufacturer, they may not know what your sawmill takes. Some companies do, but not all. I got a dog in my face. My dogs are all over the place. So let me go ahead and do this real quick. Okay, also, the dogs came up here and my son said, I caught two. Like, caught two what? Bullfrog. They look like, yeah. That's that's a leopard, no, that's a bullfrog, that's a little bullfrog. And that one looks like a leopard frog. No, they're both bullfrogs. Oh, maybe they are both bullfrogs, but they're peeing all over you. Or they're wet. No, they're wet. <laughs> got, <what? laughs> all right, so he got his he got his bullfrogs. Go ahead and put them back out there. Don't let the dogs get them. <laughs> all right, now let's go ahead and show you how to measure out this blade. Okay. Real quick before my battery dies, you'll mark a spot on your blade on the ground or on a floor or whatever. Mark it on your blade, mark it on the floor. You roll your blade out and whenever you get to that mark again, you mark it. That's how you measure out a blade and that's how you can make sure you have that number written down somewhere around your sawmill, somewhere around your blade pile whatever that may be, that's the number you take to a blade manufacturer who can save you a lot of money over a distributor of sawmills who sells saw blades. If you go to the blade manufacturers themselves, they can save you a lot of money. They can hook you up with a lot of good blades. All right, folks, I'm running out of battery here. Hope you thought this is interesting, I'm trying to put some information out there for folks, but please like, subscribe, stay tuned for more. A lot of great information still to put out there for folks. We'll see you around, thanks.